The Mongols and the samurai were both famous for their warrior spirit. While the Mongols are often criticized for their ruthless, uncompromising warfare strategies, strategies that often involved the annihilation of entire cities, they were still tactically brilliant on the battlefield. The samurai, meanwhile, are known as stoic, disciplined warriors with a strict code of behavior and virtues. Both have gone down in history for their military successes. So what happened when two of the most feared and respected warrior nations in history met on the battlefield? Welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we're exploring the time when the Mongols faced off against a samurai, twice. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. It all started diplomatic enough, at least for Mongol standards. By the late 1260s, the Mongol Empire stretched across Asia into Eastern Europe and the Arabian Peninsula. It was the largest contiguous land empire in the history of the world. Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, who was in the process of establishing the Yuan Dynasty across much of East Asia, had taken control of Korea and had set his sights on Japan. The Kamakura Shogunate had been ruling Japan since 1192, and its leader at the time was Hojo Tokimine. Kublai Khan was intent on a bit of diplomacy at first, and in 1268 he sent a polite letter to the Shogun, expressing how much he wanted to be trading partners and recognizing him as the King of Japan, but at the same time demanding that the Japanese pay the Mongols tribute, or else. The end of the letter reads, Enter into friendly relations with each other from now on. We think all countries belong to one family. How are we in the right unless we comprehend this? Nobody would wish to resort to arms. The passive-aggressive letter wasn't lost on Tokemine, who basically ignored it, secure in his belief that his island nation was strong enough to withstand anything the Mongols had to throw at them. Then, the Mongols sent another letter. This time it was downright aggressive and insulting, and reads like something a WWE wrestler might say to his opponent before the fake fighting started. It goes like this. By now, under our sage emperor, all under the light of the sun and the moon are his subjects. You, stupid little barbarians, do you dare to defy us by not submitting? Once again, the Japanese ignored the letter. Once again, Kublai was furious. By 1271, Kublai Khan had defeated the Song Dynasty and amassed a sizable navy. Using the newly subjected Korea as a jumping off point, the Mongols sailed towards the Japanese islands in autumn of 1274 with a massive fleet of between 500 and 900 ships and possibly as many as 40,000 soldiers, though accounts of the actual numbers vary. Some historians say that both the Mongols and the Japanese had a tendency to over-exaggerate the strength of their respective armies in their historical records, leading some to estimate that the total number of Mongol soldiers was a mere 3,000. However large or small the Mongol invading force was, they quickly overpowered the Japanese and their samurai warriors. They first landed on the small northern islands of Tsushima and Iki and decimated the small population. Then they headed to Hakata Bay on the island of Kyushu near the modern-day city of Fukuoka. The Mongol armada was too much for the couple thousand Japanese samurai defending the land. In addition to being outmanned, the samurai were also not used to the Mongol battle tactics. The samurai, well, they fought according to the laws of Bushido, the ancient code of conduct for the Japanese warriors. According to Bushido, when two armies meet, one warrior from each side steps out and they engage in one-on-one -on -one combat. The Mongols, however, attacked in mass, in tight, well-coordinated battalions of cavalry and infantry. When a single samurai stepped out into the open to declare himself and wait for his opponent, the Mongols simply sent a barrage of arrows his way and charged past the now-deceased soldier into the stunned samurai ranks. Oh, they weren't playing. The Mongols also had their superior weaponry, they had already developed all kinds of gunpowder projectiles that they would fling with catapults into the Japanese ranks, causing widespread devastation. They also used poison-tipped arrows and longbows that had twice the range of the samurai archers. Despite these advantages, the samurai were able to hold out for a time using their superior swords and protective armor. Much of what we now know about the Battle of Brunei, as this first clash between the samurai and the Mongols became known, was documented by a Japanese samurai named Takazaki Suenaga. In his account, the samurai, broken but not beaten, managed to retreat to safety. During the night, heavy rain and wind began to sweep across the coast. Worried that their ships may run aground, 
the Mongols retreated into open waters. This was their biggest mistake as they were hit by a massive typhoon, and by some accounts, more than a third of the Mongol ships ended up at the bottom of the Pacific, and some 13,000 troops with them. The kamikaze, or divine winds, had struck. The event went down in Japanese legend, mythologized to the point where it's difficult to parse the myth from the reality. In any event, the Mongols had to retreat back to Korea where they would regroup for another attempt a few years later. After the Mongols were blown back by the kamikaze winds, there was an interlude of sorts before they would decide to invade again in 1281. Now during this interlude, the Japanese apparently were expecting another invasion, so they built a 12 mile long wall around Hakata Bay, the site of their first near defeat in the Battle of Brunei. In 1276, Kublai Khan made a second attempt at diplomacy by sending another group of ambassadors to try to negotiate some kind of deal. Shogun Tokimine was even less impressed the second time around and had the messengers ended. Kublai tried again three years later, and again the Mongol emissaries were forced to part ways with life. Meanwhile, Kublai Khan had established a government division called the Ministry for Conquering Japan. It seemed like, once again, diplomacy was over and it was time for another crack at the island nation. In 1281, the Mongols again set out for the Korean Peninsula. This time they had even more ships, upwards of 4,000, and even more soldiers, by some account as many as 140,000. But the Japanese were prepared. They had pieced together an army of nearly 40,000. Their defensive walls around Hakata Bay were well fortified. They were ready. When the Mongols entered the bay for the second time, the battle was more leveled. The Mongol armada was still waiting for its main fleet to arrive, but in the meantime, they attacked anyway. The Mongols were unable to breach the walls, though. Samurai would sneak out in small boats in the middle of the night, under the cover of darkness, and set fire to many Mongol ships. Eventually, the Mongol reinforcements arrived. The Japanese were now faced with an invading army that was more than three times larger than theirs, and defeat seemed imminent. But then, the Japanese were saved a second time by the divine winds. Another typhoon blew through the island. In the end, only a few hundred ships were able to remain afloat. The Khan's armada was destroyed. Any survivors who made it ashore were taken out by the samurai. The Mongols were once again forced to flee with their tails between their legs, victims of the wrath of the gods. At least that's how the Japanese viewed it. The two kamikaze winds that blew through and saved the Japanese from the Mongols reached a legendary status in Japan. Warriors would draw strength from the story for centuries to come. The Mongol Empire would splinter over the next century, but the Japanese shogunates would persist for hundreds of years. A huge part of the samurai mentality was Bushido, their code of conduct which we alluded to earlier. Bushido was much more than battlefield tactics though. It was an entire framework for how a samurai should live. Values like frugality, righteousness, courage, benevolence, respect, sincerity, honor, loyalty, and self-control were held up on pedestals. Buddhism was the religion of the land at the time. While Bushido was considered an ethical framework, it wasn't considered religious. In general, the samurai actually believed they were doomed to the Japanese version of hell called Jigoku because they were trained to fight and end those who opposed them. What developed was a very Buddhist state of mind, one where the samurai were said to be unafraid of death. Overcoming the fear of death is a very Zen Buddhist type of practice. The samurai referred to it as the divine shield. It made them formidable warriors who were completely committed to their craft. And it was basically considered a craft. The idea of the warrior poet, the noble, educated, disciplined fighter, was really all the rage back then. Shortly after the Kamakura shogunate came to power in Japan, the Mongols stormed across Asia and Eastern Europe. From the Mongolian steppe, Genghis Khan created a war machine unlike any in the history of the world. By the time of his death in 1227, the Mongols controlled most of Northern and Central Asia. His grandson Kublai took things a step further, conquering more land in the East and eventually subjugating the once great Song Dynasty. Now, when you think of the Mongols, the first thing that comes to mind are men on horseback riding across plains. For the Mongols, horses were life. They basically lived on them. Their children were said to have learned to ride a horse before they could walk. How much of that is just legend and how much of that is fact is up for debate. 
In any case, you probably don't think of the Mongols as very seafaring people. Yet when Kublai conquered the Song Dynasty, he also gained control of their pretty impressive naval fleet. That, combined with their subsequent subjugation of Korea, gave them perhaps the world's most powerful navy at the time. Many Song and Korean generals and sailors ended up switching over to the Mongol side. The Mongols were very adept at getting those they conquered to team up with them. They were religiously tolerant and realized the usefulness of incorporating people of the regions they conquered back into society. As a result, by the time Kublai Khan set his sights on Japan, the Mongol navy boasted thousands of vessels that were either built using Song boat builders who had defected or that they were taken from the Song by force during the Mongol conquest of the dynasty, which to no avail proved successful against the Japanese samurai in the end. Thanks for watching. Let us know what crazy facts you know about the Mongols and samurai in the comment section. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more nutty history.